Introduction to Astroarchaeology, presented by Stuart Mason. In this lecture, Stuart discussed how the sun, moon, stars and planets are encoded into ancient temples, stone circles and pyramids. Recorded live at Megalithomania Conference 2007. Thank you very much, Hugh. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here, kicking the ball off, megalithomania. Uh, as Hugh said, we're a, a non-profit organisation, the Antiquarian Society. Um, just we encourage people to go to ancient sites. Uh, we encourage people to take their family, you know, take your friends, go and have a picnic, picnic on your, your local tumulus. Uh, that kind of thing. And by doing that, we hope to basically, uh, you know, uh, help towards uh, uh, raising awareness towards the environment because we feel that the ancient sites are one of our best examples of recycling, as in they were here 5,000 years ago and we want to make sure they're here 5,000 years from now. So uh, without further ado, I hope this talk will... In, inspire some of you maybe to uh, get involved with the, pro the project that we're running uh, because uh, we feel it's a project that's open to all, uh, young and old, and it's something which you can get a, a great deal of satisfaction from when you actually get out there and start observing uh, celestial effects happen at these ancient sites that we've got. So the, the first thing I wanted to do really was... Uh, you know, to introduce you to the, 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 the subject of astroarchaeology for those of you who might not be familiar with it. Uh, then we're going to... Let's just hope this works. Yeah. OK. Then we're going to have a look at what effects to look out for ancient sites. Then we're going to look at what tools you might need if you want to go out there into the field and, and find alignments for yourself. And then we're going to have a brief look at the people who've helped uh, help this subject along from its infancy. OK. OK, archaeology, first of all. I'm sure you're all aware of that. The study of ancient places and culture. Here we've got uh, a temple... It's called the Temple of the Seven Dolls. And you can find it at Zibul Chaltun, which is in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. OK? Now, the word astro is short for astronomy, which is the study of the stars and space. And we join that with the word archaeology, and it gives us astroarchaeology. So astroarchaeology is the study of orientation and alignment of ancient sites. And the astroarchaeologist searches for illumination points, shadow movements, uh, alignment notches, together with surveying the ancient site to deduce how it interacts with the heavenly bodies such as the sun, moon, planet and stars. Just wanted to clear up some of the terminology that we're going to be using through this talk, just so everyone's clear with what's going on. Uh, some of the most important days that the ancients uh, observed were the solstices, the summer solstice, winter solstice. Uh, there was also the equinoxes and the cross-quarter days. Now, the summer solstice is the longest day of the year, with the shortest night, and that happens on or near the 21st of June. Then you've got the winter solstice, which is the shortest day, longest night, and that's on or near the 21st of December. Then you've got the equinox, uh, equal day, equal night, and that happens on or near the 21st of September and the 21st of March. And then you've got the uh, cross-quarter days, which is something the ancient peoples were very interested in. And this is, uh, these are the days that are halfway in time between the solstices and equinoxes. 
and they can be found on or near February the 2nd, which we call Imbol. Uh, there's, there's Beltane, May the 2nd. Then we've got Lug, Lugnasad. And then we've got on the uh, Samhain, which comes in at se- the, the 2nd of November there. So you could say that You could say that the year is divided like this. As we, as we orbit around the sun, there are key points in that orbit, and we've, we've got them here. There's the one that we said in February, then there's the equinox day, and you can see opposite the equinox is the autumn equinox. Again, there's Beltane, and that's opposite Samhain. Then you've got the summer solstice here, which is opposite the winter solstice. And then you've got Lugnasad here, which is opposite in bulk. Also, I wanted to just point out, and this graphic shows it very well, you've got the perihelion and the aphelion. Uh, the perihelion is when the Earth is closest to the Sun, because our orbit around the, the, the Sun is not a perfect uh, circle. There's a there's actually a point when we're closer and at the same time there's a point when we're further away which is called the aphelion. And I've borrowed this graphic from archaeoastronomy.com which anyone who's interested in this subject might find that this site is very, very useful. This, this uh, slide here gives us what we've just been looking at in a bit more of a digestible format. And also it shows us the, the tilt of the Earth, because the tilt of the Earth is at around 23 degrees, and that gives us our seasons. So there's the sun in the middle there, and here we are orbiting around it. And I hope you can see from this, uh, from this uh, image that as the sun rev- orbits, uh, as the Earth, I beg your pardon, orbits around the sun, we've got this... Uh, we've got this... Uh, either more sun over here around the summer solstice time and less sun over here. Again, I've written this on here, archaeoastronomy.com has got this, this actually is an animated gif, which is well worth looking at if you get the chance. Ah. Okay. Now, this is something I wanted to get over to, over to you because it's quite important. When, as you can see, when, these, when the sun here goes white, for example now, this is the time of the summer solstice and over here at the winter solstice, the sun doesn't actually move that much when it's at the times of the solstices. This is why we call it a solstice, because it's a sol, sun, and stis, standstill. Whereas at the time of the equinox, now it's on the equinox, you can see, it actually gallops along the the horizon. It it, it moves a hell of a lot faster. So I've written up there, the sun's daily rising position varies only slightly around the time of the solstice. You can see that. And then the sun's daily rising position varies greatly around the time of the equinox. So look, this is... uh, three days, two days, one day before the equinox, it's now the equinox, and then look, three days, four days afterwards, it's just galloped on. Okay, that should give us all a bit of an understanding about some of the jargon that we're going to be using in this uh, talk. Now we're going to look at effects, celestial effects to look out for at ancient sites. Did you remember that first slide that I showed you? Of the, uh, the Temple of the Seven Dolls. Now we've got the Temple of the Seven Dolls again, except this time it's the equinox, the day of the equinox. In 2004, we were lucky enough to be there. Crack of dawn. The, uh, the sun rises and it goes through the temple here. And this was absolutely fantastic to go and see. It really was astonishing. Uh, The Mayan people actually, 
are responsible for building this, uh, this uh, temple. And we have to kind of deduce from the way that they built it and where they built it that they, they purposely placed it so that the equinox sun would, would go there. Now, on this site in Zibel Chal Tun, you've got something which uh, is known as the equinox corridor. And this equinox corridor is a huge uh, pathway that runs from the... Uh, Right, right from the east all the way over to the west. It's, it's, a, it's a huge like, road that goes straight the way across the site. And this can be found at one end of the site. So, here you can see people who had actually got up early and, and come to watch this, uh, watch this effect. And I wanted to include uh, this slide just to show you this because this wouldn't look out of place on Marlborough Downs or in Salisbury Plain or up in the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, to all intents and purposes, it's uh, a megalithic stone and people on, on the moment the sun was rising found themselves clustered around this stone. Possibly this was there before the actual Mayan uh, temple itself. It's very, very possible that this was there, in fact. And the, the Mayans have then incorporated their own building on top of this. Now, I wanted to show you this shot because... Oh, go back one. There we go. I wanted to show you this shot because... Oh, here we go. Here we go. Right. Okay. Because you can see, this is the end of the pathway of that equinox corridor I was talking about. And then you've got this stone, and then you've got the, uh, the, the, the Mayan temple there. And then you've got a big cluster of people who are you know, all out and about ready to see this. So my point with this is these things are still happening today, and you're still getting vast amount of people who want to see these things, because you're getting this fusion of the sun and the earth. And, you know, this isn't something now that was in the distant past that's long since forgotten. This is something that is becoming current. It's almost like a renaissance, as we'll see, uh, of people wanting to see these uh, astroarchaeological effects. And hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll all be out there taking photographs of astroarchaeological events and sending them into the database. So, that's the Equinox Corridor. That's the stone that could possibly be the original marker of the equinox alignment. And then there's the Temple of the Seven Dolls. Okay. Now I wanted to show you this because it's not a big, magnificent building. It's like a, a humble dwelling, as it were. Uh, and yet, the Mayan people in encoded the astronomical data into their cities, into the very fabric and, uh, and structure of, of their cities. So this little house here, although it might not be as impressive as some of the, some of the bigger pyramids, just in the back here, there's a little hole in the wall, and the summer solstice sun comes in through there. So... Uh, this just goes to show you, it doesn't have to be the, uh, the, big, the big temples that, that have all the glory. I wanted to show you this as well. These two little indentations here. We name this El Ojos, uh, which is in Spanish, it means the eyes. Uh, this was pointed out to us by the guard. We were actually asking him, is there anything that happens where shadows move here or any sunrises. And he goes, oh no, there's nothing like that. There's only this. And apparently, according to the guard, this is a Mayan clock. This is what you would have on the wall at home uh, to tell the time. This is what the Mayan people used. And they would tell the time of this, apparently, by using the shadows, where the shadows moved on the wall here. So I thought this was quite interesting because the Mayans were obviously very interested in shadows. This is a very humble example of it. 
And this is a very, very impressive example of it. This is probably what we're going to look at now, one of the most, if not the most, famous shadow movement effect in the astro-archaeological world. And I'm lucky enough that a member of the society, James Mitchell, who's uh, downstairs on the stall at the moment, he's, he was recently, uh, this year, in the Yucatan at the Pyramid of Kulkul Clan, which is otherwise known as El Castillo, uh, which can be found in Chechen Itza, in the Yucatan. And what you get at this pyramid is the shadow effect of a serpent sliding down the staircase uh, and creating an illusion that lasts about an hour and ten minutes. And this is why I find this so fascinating, because it isn't a sunrise, and it isn't, you know, over and done within five minutes. It isn't a sunset. Or This is actually something that lasts, you know, a, a, a good amount of time. It must have been just incredible, like, to try and, you know, have a mind to, to build something like this. Uh, you've got Chechen, it's, Chechen Itza here. It's a mixture of Toltec a Mayan, and it's full of cosmological symbolism. The four sides, for example, uh, represent the four seasons. There are 365 steps depicting the solar year. There are 52 panels each, uh, for each year in the Mayan century, and there are 18 terraces for the 18 months in the Mayan religious year. Now, the effect I'm about to show you isn't at sunrise and it isn't at sunset. It's at about 4.15pm, just in time for a cup of tea. And what happens is this. I want you to keep your eye on this part here. Now, you can see the amount of people here. When we were there, the shaman told us that just 12 years ago, you'd get about 200 people going to watch this. Now, apparently, you get crowds of up to 60,000 going there to watch this. And the shaman seemed to think that that was good. And the more people that went to go and watch this, the better. So, here, I hope you can see it, it's starting to build up. Because what happens is the shadow from, that's from the sun hits this part here, this bit of pyramid wall here and it starts to, can you see there's one there, there's one there, there's one there. It'll become clearer anyway. As the sun on its transit through the sky gets, gets to a certain point, it starts creating this fantastic shadow effect. You can see it building up a bit more now. You see that there? And that bit there? That bit there? That bit there? It's just building up and building up. Ah, it's getting good now. This chap's decided to stand up. And, and you can see that this part here, there's something happening, you know, the, the tension's mounting, as it were. If you were there now, this would be nail-biting nail stuff. You'd be really kind of thinking, yeah, it's, you know, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And believe it or not, this, this would continue and this would keep going and you would be there and you would have your camera and you would be taking photographs and you'd be thinking, yeah, it's going to happen. And then this would happen. <laughs> An astroarchaeologist's worst nightmare. You are at the mercy of the elements with this subject. It's no easy ride. You can be there at the crack of dawn waiting for the sun to come into the temple. You can be there at 4.15 in the afternoon waiting for the serpent to slide down and the heavens will always have their say. It happens on more than one occasion, believe me, but this is what adds to it because this adds that kind of, oh, you need everything working, you need everything, you need the, the timing, you need to be there, you need a clear sky, you need so many factors to get the observation. Anyway, 
look at these people. They're in literal abandon. I hope you can see it a bit clearer here. Look, the, the shadow was there for long enough that it didn't kind of uh, ruin the effect, but as the, as the shadow, as the cloud moved away, you can see it here. Can you see this? I hope everyone can see it. It's, it's, uh, this is, the, this is the, the shadow bit being cast from here. And when I looked at this, I thought, wow, I wonder if it was like this, you know, a thousand years ago, except everyone's got their, pho- their, their, their cameras and they're all taking photos like this. But this could have been the ancient Mayan people kind of just worshipping the snake as it came down the, 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 the staircase there. Who knows? This one is a bit of a closer. Can you focus it in a bit more up there? I think we're just a little bit out of focus. But what this image should show us is a bit clearer of the snake. This is a good example up here. I mean, this is it. This is the real deal, really. And the brick, well, we call it the brickwork. These are like, you know, little bits of stone that have all been carved. They actually appear to be, uh, the, the, they, they give the illusion of being the serpent scales, if you like. And this moves over the course of an hour. And that's probably the best shot that Jim got. I um, mean, and you can see here the serpent shadow connecting with the head down here. This completes the effect, really, because at the bottom there's this huge, huge serpent head, and you can see here the, uh, the shadow. And that will move and will give you an absolutely, you know, incredible, incredible effect, really, to, to actually sit there and then design and build something like that. I think you've got to take your hat off to the people that did that. Um, what's interesting about this and what's only recently been discovered is the fact that this happens at the time of the equinox at night when it's a full moon. And that was only recently discovered by chance by uh, an archaeologist who was allowed to walk through the site at night, because you're not actually allowed in Chechnitsa at night. They close it very early. But nevertheless, this this chap was walking through the the site at the time of the full moon, when the moon was in the correct position, and they had this flash of, you know, uh, realisation that the full moon was creating exactly the same effect as what the sun does. And if you think about it, that makes perfect sense because the moon mimics the sun's path during the year. And at the time of the equinox, the moon will be in more or less the same position as the sun. So uh, there's always something to look out for. If you're you know, ever in one of these positions, uh, situations, you can always remember that the moon has its shadow effect as well. There's Jim as well. I just wanted to put him in because he was as proud as Punch getting those images. Okay, now we're going to stay in the Americas, uh, Central America this time. We're in Guatemala. This is Lago Attic Land, San Pedro. And I wanted to show you this because you've got uh, a merging of a natural landscape Now, this is a volcanic, completely natural landscape, and it's known in uh, Spanish as la Indian Dormiendo, or the sleeping Indian, or the face of the Indian, or the nose of the Indian. Nevertheless, the point is that this is an anthropomorphic uh, figure in the landscape. Uh, Just show you a better idea of what I mean. Here, I've flipped this image just to give you a bit more of a... Here's the eye, here's the nose, this is the mouth. But this actual figure stretches out. You've got a body, a chest, a leg, and it's called the sleeping Indian. Now, if you're standing at the right spot, which happens to be a pre-Mayan temple in the middle of the lake, what happens is this. On the full moon nearest to the winter solstice, the moon sets into the eye. 
which is an absolutely amazing thing to, to witness. But again, you've got to be in the right place at the right time to see it. Okay. We're staying in uh, the Americas. This is Crack and Rock community in Wupataki, New Mexico. You've got a summer solstice sunrise there. Uh, it's a line to this dwelling. The sunlight comes in. You can see it from this shot. Okay. I wanted to uh, show you this one as well because this is something we're going to touch on in a little bit. The uh, Pueblito Indians were very interested in these daggers of light. And this noon dagger here happens around the time of the equinox. Okay? And this is possibly something to do with an old Navajo legend where uh, the princess was impregnated with twins by a beam of sunlight. And this is encoded within this graphic, if you like. And then at the right time, at noon, which is around midday, the sun shines in and casts this dagger of light straight away across the, uh, straight away across the, uh, the carvings on the wall there. So at any other time of the year, you might just notice that there's some carvings on the wall and think nothing more of it. But at the right time of year, you're going to get this dagger of sun effect happening. So this is giving you things to look for. This is giving you a, a different way to look at a site when you arrive there. If there's some carvings on the wall, are they aligned to anything? Will the sun hit them at any time of the year? Okay. Lugnar Sad Sunrise. Now this is interesting because this can be found in Colorado. If you're standing 43 feet over a rock overhang, I don't fancy this myself, but any of you are welcome to try it. There's actually a carving on the wall of a, what's interpreted as a, as a a glyph representing the sun, which is a circle with a dot in the middle. Very ancient and traditional symbol for the sun. Anyway, if you're standing with your back on that, on this cliff overhang, at Lugnarsad, this happens. So, this is almost like, uh, this is almost like saying, if you're standing in the right place by the sun glyph, then Lu, the god, of, the god of the sun, will appear. Quite a nice one, I thought, if a bit dangerous. Okay. This is interesting, because the main axis of the Pueblo is aligned to the sunset. This is Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon. And this here is the kind of main access to the site. So we've already touched on one access right at the beginning of the talk. This is another access. And the, the village is pretty much built around this. And when you think about it, you'd have probably needed to have done something like that if you were going to build a, a village in the middle of the desert. If you aligned it to the equinox, equal day, equal night, then you would know that when the sun was rising or setting along this line, that you were halfway through your year. So it makes perfect sense to do that. The Walter Sand Clan Petroglyph. This is just touching again on uh, what we were mentioning earlier about rock carvings. You may well have come across some of these on your travel, just... Uh, paintings on the wall or, or small carvings. If you did, this maybe give you a, a different way to look at them. Because on the uh, winter solstice, the sun 
shines through two rocks which are out of shot and illuminates these. It literally frames them. So it makes you realise that they weren't just haphazardly thrown up there. You know, it wasn't like, come on, let's just put them on the wall over here. There's actually a reason for it. But you've got to be in the right place at the right time to know that or to find that out. Which is, again, why this subject is, it fascinates me so much because there's so many uh, twists and turns and there's so many things that you can discover that people, or that haven't been discovered yet. Right, now this, I must say, is one of my favourite uh, astro-archaeological sites. And uh, a lot of the work has been done by Anna Safara, who has this website, The Solstice Project. And she's done some sterling work at Fujita Boot. This is a boot, this whole thing here. And it can be found in Chaco Canyon, New Mexico. So if you're on your travels, travelling through the desert, as I'm sure most of you do, and you come across a butte like this, you might just get that, you know, that curiosity feeling to go and climb it. You might feel like climbing up it. And if you did climb it, you might find this. A pile of old stones. But because your inquisitive mind wouldn't just let it wouldn't let it just rest there. You'd feel like wanting to explore a bit more and you'd scramble around the rocks and you'd, you'd go around the back because you'd be intrigued as to what was there. And when you got there, you'd notice that it all paid off because inside you would see this. Can you see this? This is actually in here. This is a spiral that's been carved on the wall, but there's not just one spiral there. There's two spirals. And this is actually what's carved around the back of those stones on the wall there. There's a spiral here, and there's another one there. So there you are, you're on your hands and knees. You've just clambered to the top of a butte, you've gone into the cave, you've found this on the wall. What does it all mean, you ask yourself? What can this possibly mean? Do you remember earlier we had a look at those daggers, that dagger, the noon dagger that I was talking about? OK, look at these daggers here. There's one there, one there, one there. So there's, there's daggers that are going to happen with this. OK, next one. And this is why I really love this, because this is, this is genius, really. When you think that that's just a pile of old stones. On the equinox, solar markings at midday. So at midday, the sun, you see this graphic up here, is coming down, because it's at its highest point. The sun is coming down, and it's hitting the top of these stones here, okay, at midday. So the sun's coming down, hitting those stones. On the equinox, equal day, equal night, two daggers of sunlight are cast. One just here, to the right of the centre of the circle, uh, the spiral, just here, and one here, through, through that tiny little spiral, right through the centre of that. That's on the equinox. On the summer solstice, one dagger, when, when the sun is at its high point, one dagger of sunlight goes right the way through the centre of that spiral. On the winter solstice, two daggers, one there, one there either side of that spiral. 
Now, Anna Safara and her team who have been working on this still don't know whether this pile of boulders have been carved inside to allow these sunlight to come through or whether it's a natural feature and the, the spiral was carved afterwards. They're still unsure. They're still researching it to find out. OK, then you've got solar or lunar markings at rising. So if you look at this graph over here, when the uh, moon or sun is rising, obviously it's going to be coming in at a completely different angle. And it's coming in from this angle, from the side here. I hope that's clear enough for everyone to see. Uh, the, the, the rays of the sun and the moon are coming in, not from down below, but from this side. And they're illuminating the spiral from that direction. Now, at the time of the equinox, the sun and the moon illuminate the whole thing. You see that? The rise, the, the light from the sun and the moon illuminate both of these as it comes in this way. Now, when it's the minor standstill of the moon, I'm not going to, the moon's got many different cycles. I'm not going to get bogged down in that at the moment. But there's a minor and a major standstill of the moon. When it's the minor standstill of the moon, half of this spiral is illuminated with a straight line as well, right the way across. And then at the major standstill of the moon, this side is just illuminated. So the next time you're trampling through the desert and you come across a big pile of boulders, have a second look, because you never know what could be hidden within it. OK. This is a, this is a very famous site. Easter Island, Ahuakivi, and the Maui heads are aligned to the equinox sunset. On Easter Island, the heads, apart from these, these section here, which can be found at Ahuakivi, all face inwards. But the ones that face outwards, out to sea, these ones at Ahuakivi, face a point on the horizon where the equinox sun sets, which I think is fantastic. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. This is a beauty as well. This is, uh, can be found in the South Pacific. Ha Amonga a Maui, as the locals call it the burden of Maui, 12-tonne stone trilophon located in Tonga. I've actually been to this site, and it is really impressive. It's massive, huge, huge site to be in it. This is all made of coral. That's actually made all of coral. And the king of Tonga uh, checked all this out. Um, it's actually aligned to the summer solstice sunrise. But it's not aligned as in through the gateway here like what we have at Stonehenge. It's aligned, the axis of the lintel is aligned. So it's this, this point here actually points to the, to the sunrise on, on the summer solstice, which is interesting. Huge blocks of coal. Well worth a visit. <coughs> OK, staying in the Pacific, this is in, can be found in New Zealand. New Zealand is littered with stone circles. It's incredible. Uh, apparently, the, the, the government and the people of New Zealand don't realise that, but uh, that's another story. Why I wanted to include this 
is because it gives us an example of uh, landscape. Now, this hill here and this hill here are regarded as being very, very sacred or very, very holy to the Maori people. And this is all aligned to the hill here and there's more stones further on in the field and so on. And what you get is basically at the time of the equinox, the sun rising out of this hill like that, boom. And then you get all the stars and whatnot coming out of here as well until it comes to this extreme point and then it goes back again to the equinox point and then back again. So another example of uh, some South Pacific astroarchaeology. I wanted to include this. This was just recently sent, uh, sent to me uh, by Michael. Beautiful shot, I think. The Sol de Glaze, so the Sun Church in France. And Michael has promised to tell me where this actually can be found. Because people keep asking me and I'm like, ah, I don't know the exact place. But he's promised to find out for us. Nevertheless, the point of this shot is the sun coming in on the altar there and just being focused onto, uh, onto the altar. Uh, again, at midday. Uh, I think that's a lovely shot. And it shows you how the, the church has kind of incorporated this, uh, this uh, solstice calendrical information into its architecture. OK, I'm just going to touch on this because obviously it's, you know, I think some of our speakers are going to talk about New Grange and so on, but you can't really have an astroarchaeological talk without mentioning New Grange. There's the winter solstice alignment, the sun coming in now. I thought that was definitely worth showing you guys. And again, I wanted to put this in because just to get over the point that, you know, these aren't things that are just lost in the distant palm. There's almost there's this renaissance going on where people just want to see these things and be involved with it. And, you know, more and more people are going to these sites and uh, witnessing these effects. And I've also included this as to make a comparison with, with the one we've got here in the UK, because this is winter solstice in Newgrange. And uh, just up the road from here, in the village of Wello, you've got this, which I'm sure some of you have been to, Stony Littleton, magnificent chamber. Uh, the Antiquarian Society had a little expedition there for the winter solstice uh, a couple of years ago now. Well worth doing. If you're ever up early on the winter solstice, get down to this burial chamber because it's almost like our own miniature Newgrange, just on our, door, our own doorstep. And you can get to Stony Littleton and it's a proper get on your hands and knees job and crawl into the, the chamber. And if you do crawl into the chamber, as we did, we were, we were sitting right on the back, backs to the wall, and the first rays of the sun on the winter solstice started to penetrate the chamber. Magnificent. The, really, you really get the, the kind of effect of your doing something that the ancients were doing. It puts you into that mindset. You know, it's a, it's a timeless, timeless experience. Uh, the sun's first rays are entering here. This is a bit when the, the, the sun came out from a cloud. You can see the, as it was creeping up the chamber. This is what I was trying to show you with this shot. The sun creeping inside the chamber there. And there at 9.14am. So this wasn't actually, you know, as the, the, at the crack of dawn. This was, you know, a little bit afterwards. There's a huge cloud again in the way. But as the, the cloud moved, there was still a, it, the sun was still in enough of a position to give us the effect that we were after. And what was interesting to be in there and notice was the way that the sun bounced around inside the uh, chambers. It was bouncing off of one wall, bouncing onto the next, bouncing, and it literally bounced all the way down the chamber there. And we got this, this fantastic effect happening. So that's the sun entering a very, very ancient chamber. What we've got here 
is a different sort of chamber. This is a fascinating example of some Victorian celestial planning. Box tunnel. Some of you may have been inside Box Tunnel on the train there. Built by Isambard Kingdom Brunel. One thousand four hundred and fifty two yards in length and a gradient of one to one hundred from east to west. But what I like about this, what's interesting about this, is that Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who, who built this tunnel, actually constructed it on, in such a way that on his birthday, April the 9th, the sun shines down the chamber there. That's cheeky, isn't it, really? But nevertheless, you know, he, Isambard got away with it. And uh, I'd just like some volunteers to get me some photographs of this happening. So if you'd just like to put your hands up now. No, it's actually been done. Apparently there are uh, rail staff who've been there and, you know, they've actually got photographs of this and I'm desperate to see one. But uh, apparently this is what happens. So this, you know, wasn't necessarily in distant past. This is recent past and uh, a beautiful bit of uh, celestial planning there. Okay. Ah, this is beautiful. Again, uh, I wanted to include this because, it, again, it's uh, an example of the way the natural landscape has been used. And the ancients have picked out a spot where you can see this fantastic effect. It's called the Leek Double Sunset, uh, Staffordshire. Uh, and what happens is the sun sets and then reappears and then it sets again. So you get two sunsets, which is absolutely beautiful. Now, I don't want you to get confused with a cloud in the sky because this little lump where the, or hill where the sun sets behind is called the cloud. That's what it's known locally as. That's the name of it. And as you can see, here's the sun setting and then it's reappearing here to set again. And this beautiful effect was originally, uh, originally found, or I wasn't originally found, it was originally written down by Dr. Plot, who uh, is this chap here. And he actually done a beautiful little wood carving, a wood cutting. This is Dr. Plot's wood cut. And this is just showing you that, you know, this subject was, uh, this is 1686, so, you know, th this subject has, has been around for a while, and these things have been noticed now for at least three, four hundred years. At the same time as Dr. Plot done this, this woodcut was put into a gentleman's uh, magazine of the same period, and you can see here the sun disappearing and then uh, reappearing, there it is, reappearing to set again behind. Now, there's a church where the, if you want to go and see this happen, you have to be standing in the churchyard of St Edward the Confessor. And the present day church uh, dates back to the 14th century, but there's a reference to a building on this site in Norman times, which was destroyed by a fire in 1294. And the records state that there was a midsummer fair. Can we just move that along, actually? The records state that there was a midsummer fair held in the churchyard here at Leek from the 13th century, with the main attraction being the double sunset. So this is something that we could, we could uh, deduce that 
before the church was actually built there, this is probably a, you know, a pre-Christian site of, that was you know, a major feature in the ancient times. And anyway, this is the St. Edward the Confessor Church, and this is the, the zone you have to be in to, to watch that effect happening. And you can go there today. It's still possible to go and witness this now. Uh, and you'll find a, a big crowd of people watching it with you. Okay. The Sleeping Beauty. We mentioned anthropomorphic figures. An anthropomorphic figure is a figure that resembles a human form. And this is the human form here. The Sleeping Beauty, in English. Or Kaliak na Montiak. In Gaelic, and I hope there's no Gaelic speakers there who can pull me up on that. The Old Woman of the Moors. Now, this can be found on the island of Lewis, which is an outer Hebridean island, right off the coast of west, the west of Scotland. And the Antiquarian Society went on a, uh, a mission to watch the lunar standstill, moonrise, from the island of Callanish, or from the stone circle of Callanish. And we were lucky enough to have a clear moonrise. There it is. There's a sleeping beauty. And here is the moon rising out of her belly. So that was the image, that was the shot that we went to get. Now to see this, you have to be standing at the stone circle of Kalanish. And... It's a fantastic thing to, to actually watch. It, it really was incredible when that came up. I'm not going to go on too much about this because Gerald's going to talk about this in greater detail. But I just wanted to include it to uh, give you an idea. That's what I borrowed off of you, Gerald. This is from Gerald Ponting, who's around here somewhere. Uh, this is his graphic. But it shows you very clearly the path of the that the moon rising from the, go the goddess there and then setting between the stones. And there's a website if you want to get that in a bit more detail. Now, this was my moon set photograph. We got the moon rise okay, that was pretty clear. But uh, the moon set was a bit trickier because there was a big cloud again uh, that appeared. But, you know, that's as good as it got, really. I didn't get a better shot than that. But you can see, nevertheless, the glow of the full moon there uh, breaking out from behind the clouds and appearing just, just, through, the, uh, just through the stones there at Kalanish. And don't worry if you miss this, because you can see it in 18.6 years from now. So, it's not a problem. I've just put this one in here, just to show you. There's another bit of moon. A circular temple on the island of Hyperborean, where the moon appeared to be close to the earth and that the gods visited the island every 19 years. That was Diodorus in his Biblia Fica, which I'm going to come on to in a minute. Okay. Okay, I've, I'm sure you all know about Stonehenge, but we have to include this because it's a classic. This is winter solstice at Stonehenge, the most famous astroarchaeological site on the planet, the one that pretty much... If you go anywhere, anywhere in the world and talk to someone about Stonehenge, they've heard of the sun coming up there on the longest day. So, you know, Stonehenge really is a, really is a beacon of, uh, 
of, of, of hope in the astro-archaeological world. Let's just whiz through these. Okay, this is the, this is the hill stone and the 51 degree alignment. Some researchers have suggested that as the sun's rising, the shadow from the hill stone will grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until it touches the circle. I've not yet seen this, but I would dearly love to. The only problem, there's the alignment. Next. The only problem is, now, <laughs> when you go to see the, the alignment happening, there's thousands of people there, so you've got to move them out of the way. But nevertheless, well worth going to see. Summer solstice, sunrise, there's the hillstone. And there's the sun. Okay, I'm bringing it back home to Sussex, which is where we're based. Uh, this can be found in Lewis. It's called Lewis Priory Mount, or the Tump. And uh, what we found out from the work of Rodney Castledon uh, is there's actually the centre of a solar clock. And if you go to the top of this on the summer solstice, you can see the sun rising over a long barrow, which is on a distant golf course now. But uh, nevertheless, very, very impressive monument right in the middle of Lewis. There's the Long Barrow. The summer solstice sunset happens over Black Cap, which is full of archaeology. There's a round, a round, uh, pos a round house and post holes up there and some uh, tumuli. Then the winter solstice as well. You've got Beddingham Hill. Uh, you've got a Barrow Cluster. And then over Swanborough Hill, Another barrow cluster, except this has been completely erased due to ploughing. But we know there was a barrow cluster there because of uh, old maps from Grinsall, who was a barrow worker around the turn of the century. Okay, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to have to whiz through this now. This is in Sussex, a lovely little uh, piece of astroarchaeology. This was uh, submitted by Paul Garwood from the University of Birmingham who's been researching the devil's jumps. Uh, here, we've got a, a barrow cluster, and as you'll see that they're, they're in a pretty much in a straight line, and they are aligned to this little niche here in the hill, which is where the summer solstice sun sets, which is quite nice. So if you're out and about looking at barrows on your travels and stuff, and you notice some in a line, could be well worth taking the bearing or the angle because you might well be finding something that no one's ever come, a, come across. I think it was uh, Robin Heath who said that this is literally a treasure trove here in the UK because there's so much of this stuff that hasn't been discovered yet. It's literally waiting for you to put your name on it as a, you know, discovering, the, uh, discovering these alignments. Okay, I'm going to carry on. There's the, the devil's jumps. As I was saying, it's in a straight line. Uh, aligned towards the, the, the solstice sunset there. There's also uh, another barrow cluster in Hayshot Down. You can see the similarity. They're kind of orientated in such a way as well. These are literally within a stone's throw of each other. And, uh, and uh, we have, yeah. If you ever find any barrows, keep, keep them going. Okay. Midsummer Boulevard. Have you heard of this? Who lives? Anyone in Milton Keynes, please? Put your hand up. Anyone who's ever been there? I saw a hand over here somewhere. Ah, it's true, isn't it? Midsummer Boulevard. What you've got on the left of Midsummer Boulevard is Avery, Bo Avery Boulevard. What you've got on the right of Midsummer Boulevard is Silbury Boulevard. Yeah? Why have I included this? You must think I'm mad. Well, Right at the end of it as well, you've got the train station. What actually happens, as it's been told to me, 
on the summer solstice, as the sun rises, the sun comes down, and it's at the right angle, the sun comes down Midsummer Boulevard. Not only does it come down Midsummer Boulevard, in the middle of the, the, of, of the boulevard, there's a foundation stone, which is the stone for the, for the city. And you have rival groups of Christians and pagans trying to out-chant each other as, as the sun's rising. Now, as the sun creeps its way down uh, Midsummer Boulevard, it hits the station. And then the station, apparently, is all made of glass. And the sun's rays hit the station, and this all begins to illuminate like a big Pandora's box. So as well as that, you've got cars driving up and down bits of Midsummer's Boulevard. And as someone who told me, who, who lived in Milton Keynes, people not notoriously are driving up there on the, on the summer solstice, and they crash because the sun's in their eyes, and they're just driving into the shop, front of shops and stuff. So, next slide, please. So there we are. Funnily enough, you've got this... Uh, You've got this footpath that goes right the way up Midsummer Boulevard, and it's all targeted towards this point up here, which is a beacon point. It's, you know, I don't know, I don't know the, the answers to this, but nevertheless, next slide, please. Uh, you've got the, there it is, the, oh, it's here. That's what it's all targeted to, this white thing, which on the maps suggests it's, what well, it says it's a beacon point. So there you are. Midsummer Boulevard in Milton Keynes. This is an example of how you know, modern day planners have actually incorporated the celestial mechanics into you know, Milton Keynes. Next slide, please. Okay, whoa, we're going to just whiz through this. We've done this, we've done this, we've done this. No, we haven't. Tools for the enthusiast. Okay, this is what you guys are going to need to get out there and start finding alignments. Uh, this is a map of Yucatan. You probably need one of Glastonbury or wherever you're from. Comes in very handy. Next slide, please. A compass. If you can get yourself a good compass, you, this is the best way to do it. Find, you can find uh, roughly where the alignment is by using a compass. And then for finer, greater accuracy, you would use a theodolite. But believe you me, this is a lot easier than carrying around a theodolite. Next slide, please. You might need one of these. Luckily enough, we sell them. That's a result, isn't it? A solstice finder, made to order. Next slide, please. So that's one of the Antiquarian Society products. Come and see us on the stall if you're interested in one of them. They tell you all the angles, what you're going to need to know, what you're going to need to look out for. I've overrun people. I'm sorry. All I could do at this point is say thank you very much. Thank you. This has been a Megalithomania audio production. For more information, visit megalithomania.co.uk.